so good to be here today, and I, uh, I pray that um, you'll indulge me. They said I could preach about an hour and a half. Is that good? <laughs> Anybody have reservations for lunch? We want to make sure that uh, you cancel those now, and, uh, and all of that. Now, it's always good to be in an opportunity to share the Word, and I'm always excited to do that. Um, it is one of the perks of being a pastor. Um, this is probably the best part of the job is to be able to articulate the word um, to folks and, uh, and to just share it. Um, if you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3, and uh, that's going to be my text. Um, I'll just explain a couple things. I, I'm, I require bifocals, which I've fought for the last six years. So I'll be taking these off and on. That's not to make anybody nervous or distract, but I can't read my giant, super giant, large print Bible. It's uh, not quite the altar Bible, but it's still the same. But uh, let's, let's read the text, and then we'll go to prayer, and we'll get into our message today. 1 Samuel chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, says, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation, and it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was. And while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. So he ran to Eli, and he said, Here am I, for you called me. And he said, I can't turn my page, apologize. I did not call, lie down again, and he went and lay down. So the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli, and he said, here am I, for you called me. He answered, I did not call you, my son. And lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and he went to Eli and he said, Here I am, uh, here I am for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down and it shall be if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. And when the Lord came and he stood uh, and called at, as he, as, at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which, uh, at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli and all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. We look at this passage of scripture real quickly and then I want to go to prayer. I want to get our hearts in the right place. We, we kind of remember this story from Sunday school, I know I do, and I, I, can, I can definitely recall the details of it. But this morning I want to draw our attention to the word call. God calls us in no less than four ways. He'll call us in many other ways, but no less than four, and that's what we want to look at today. But let's, uh, let's bow together for prayer, and let's just uh, align our hearts with His. Our Father, we pause to thank You for the privilege that we have to be here today. This is a true freedom that we, uh, we can sometimes take advantage of. And Lord, your word reminds us that we should never get in the way of getting together and being surrounded with your folks and to be in your presence. God, thank you for this privilege, this freedom that we have. Lord, we've walked through these doors today with some excitement and some unsureness. We might have had some issues already this week that have presented themselves. And as they're important and they're things that we might have to deal with, we pray this morning that you'll move them aside so that we can focus on you. God, we pray that you would allow the distractions of this life to be separated from us at this moment so that we might hear directly from you. Just as you called to Samuel that day, we pray today that you would call to us. We pray, Father, that you would align our hearts and our minds with you and that we might just listen intently with our hearts, that we might do more than just listen. 
that we might become doers of this word. God, I pray today that the words that leave my mouth are not mine. That, Lord, you might take these words from my heart and from your lips and apply them to our lives. And, Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God calls us no less than four ways. So when you hear the word God calling us, there's something that comes to mind. We think that this is a, uh, you know, this divine appointment like Samuel had. Um, I, I can't say that I've ever had God specifically and directly speak audibly to me, and I think that's something we look forward to. But we have the scriptures, and we know that the scriptures are a way that he communicates with us. So when we hear the, hear the phrase, this call of God, we tend to attribute it to a vocational calling or a missional engagement where God's calling us to do something very specific. Um, so we want to look today uh, briefly at four specific calls that God calls us to be a part of. I'm going to give them to you and then we're going to go back and unpack each one. The first one is, first and foremost, a call to salvation. God's not going to speak to you beyond that one until you know him. And he knows you well. And so the call to salvation is our first one. The second one is a call to sanctification. A call to sanctification. The third one is a call to service. And then the fourth one is a call to accountability. And, uh, and these apply to any believer. These apply to all of us. So uh, the, the first one we want to look at today is the call to salvation. In today's text, we see how Samuel had not yet known the Lord. He was still without any real connection other than he was in training. And, there, you know, we can definitely understand that uh, we learn a lot uh, of the lingo. We know the dialogue. We, we, can, we know when to stand. We know when to sit. We understand uh, some of the phrases and uh, the, the, the language of Christianity. We can definitely get through and folks would say, oh, yeah, that's, they, they love the Lord. They know the Lord. But the truth of the matter is only God knows the heart. Only God understands the heart. And so that true call, when God calls us to, to salvation, is a moment in which he's speaking directly with you, and you're bringing... The, this, these, these things are amazing, too, because it's not just in the single moment. God's been planting that seed for a very long time. He's been applying places in your life where he's trying to get you to recognize him. And, and it's an amazing process to, to see that. I grew up in a Christian home. My... Dad was a minister for many, many years. And so I knew the lingo. I knew how to do the, the, the Christian walk. I, in fact, I, I knew how to do both. You know, I could definitely be, you know, a, a little bit of a mess maker. And uh, I, in fact, you know, pastor's kids were, were typically address, addressed as the worst of the, of the bunch. Amen. And the reason that is, is because we're typically in the spotlight. And uh, so I used to get blamed for quite a bit of things. And and I, I kind of got the attitude that, well, you know what, if I'm going to get blamed for it, I might as well do it. So I sort of shifted my ideal to just, you know, let's just be, you know, a little bit of a mess maker. Truth of the matter is, I kind of thought at some point salvation was something that was just sort of a byproduct of being in a pastor's home. My dad had decided that, uh, you know, it was, it was one of those... Uh, Changes in life that he, God felt, he felt that God was calling him to the mission field. And we went into camp ministry. I thought this was great. I'm no longer a pastor's kid. You know, this is awesome. And I move out of that position. But it was actually our, our first year there at, at, in camp ministry that God began to do a, a real connection with me. And at age 11, he called me into salvation. Salvation is an experience that we all will come to some point. Now, we're either going to reject it or we're going to accept it. The gospel is something you can't beat into somebody. It's not something that we can force on anybody. But the gospel is something that is applied to us through the working of the Holy Spirit, where he introduces us to these things. And a lot of times it's in a moment of need. Now Samuel in this story is, you know, he's just in bed. He's resting. He's getting ready for the next day of studies and training. But God begins to call in his life. So the call of salvation is first and foremost. It's paramount to us. Because without salvation, we just exist. Now, we're going to spend eternity somewhere. You will spend eternity somewhere. The truth of the matter is, that somewhere is now the truth. It's up to us. The free gift of the gospel is for us to receive and to take. No one can force it on us. And so this call to salvation is a great reminder of the first call. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says this, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, 
even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We will stand one day before the Lord without an excuse whether or not we chose him. Truth be told, he knows who you are. Scripture reminds us that he knows the number of hairs on our head. As I get older, there's fewer and fewer, so he's got less to count. He knows us. He knows our thoughts. He, uh, he understands how we feel. Now, a lot of times we'll say, well, that gives us an excuse to kind of be an idiot at times. No! He knows us. He knows that we're fallible and we're human. He knows that we're going to make mistakes. I love the passage of Scripture. Uh, Sister Key shared this morning. One of my favorite is Psalm 139. I love that passage. Because He knows us. And, and the great thing is He knows us way before. Think about that. How many times have we prayed for somebody that we know and love that we want them to come to salvation? How many times has our heart just ached for someone that has rejected God? Well, I can't imagine my life without God. I can't imagine operating in this existence without God. I mean, even when I was out without Him, I, I just sort of knew, like, if something went wrong, you prayed. If something went wrong, you, 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 you know, you, you reached out to somebody and, and you made agreements with God. God, if you get me through this, I'll, I'll do this. Caution there. A little side note. The Bible says God would rather us not make a promise at all than to make one and break it. So be careful. Careful what you promise, God. And just kind of to mess you up a little bit more, if you've made a promise to God, I pray that you start praying. Now, Lord, help me remember that I can make good on that promise. Because God hasn't forgotten it. If we consider this call to salvation, the reason I want to spend more time on this is this is the most important one that there is. All of these others kind of fall into place like a puzzle. I mean, they really fit nicely. But without salvation, we're only going to try and we're going to fail. Without salvation, we're, we're going to attempt, but we're just not going to succeed. Because we don't have the working of the Holy Spirit inside of us. We don't have His connection. We don't have His power working with us. You know, the Bible says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, right? Amen. That's a great verse. That only applies to Christians. That only applies to those. I mean, we're still going to struggle. We're still going to have issues in life. We're still going to, you know, have some hurdles to overcome. But the call to salvation guarantees us the working and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. That He now is with me and He is at arms with me. The Bible says He'll never leave us nor forsake us, which means He's always with me, no matter what. Now that does two things. That gives us an assurance and this power that just, you know, sort of empowers us to say, I can do anything. I can do anything. But it also is a reminder that when we're messing up and we're doing things selfishly and we're doing things we want to do that aren't aligning with God, He's still with us. He's still right there with us. So cautions us. How many remember the old, ad, the, uh, the old adage, we have bracelets and everything, what would Jesus do? I don't know how well that worked for you. It didn't really work for me. I kind of forgot it went up my sleeve a lot of times. The reminder should be implanted in us. What does Jesus really want me to do here? Well, the first thing is to answer his call. Eli had no idea that the message that God was about to give Samuel was really negative for him. But the idea here is that he recognized that God was speaking to Samuel. He recognized it. So the second call after coming to salvation is the call to sanctification. In Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, it says, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So in this text, we see that God is actually summoning His children to experience godly living. Sanctification is a word we probably don't use a lot. You know, I, I kind of think we've just come through COVID, and we, we've gotten sanitizing happy, haven't we? My hands are raw. I've used that. I like the Bath and Body Works one better. I think it smells nicer. And the other one's just too sanitary. And it's raw, man. It's just, I, I know, you want to kill the germs. I get it. Sanctifying is living holy. It's, it's sanitizing who we are in God. 
We are fallible creatures. We're going to mess up. We're going to do things wrong. We're going to focus on our selfish desires. There are times in our life where we're going to just say, you know what? I don't care. I had, we had rules growing up in our house. I'm in the middle of seven children. We had lots of rules. In fact, I thought the Bible was hard to live by, but the rules at home were pretty hard. And, and rules were things that we were given the instructions. These are the rules, and then these are the consequences. I was really glad we kind of knew that, because then I could wager, is the consequence something I can do, or does it really outweigh the pleasure I think I'm going to get from doing the thing I shouldn't do? So I, I sort of balanced that. And there were many times where I thought, yeah, I can handle being grounded for a week. It's okay. Of course, my parents then had always you know, invoke the idea that we all, we can subjectively change the consequence if we find that it's not, not effective. So, you know, I, I, I was spanked twice in my entire life. I just want you to know I'm not a good kid, was never a good kid. It's just that they found out that I bruised pretty bad and it looked really, really ugly. And so <laughs> they had to find alternative methods for discipline. It didn't mean that I didn't press those limits or reach out and look for how far are they going to go? How easy is this going to be? They can't hit me. You know, amen, that's awesome. But uh, discipline is one of those things that God instructs us that he does it because he loves us. In Hebrews it says that he chastises or disciplines those that he loves. I love to discipline my children, not for the sake because I'm this ogre of a parent, but I want them to get it right. I want them to understand that this, this thing called life is one of those challenges that you, you're going to navigate and you're going to make your own decision. At some point, as parents, we've got to let them go and kind of do their own thing. But I want them to understand that there's a consequence. There's a consequence. Sanctify. I, I've got I've to kind of daily do this thing. Where I, I've got to sanitize who I am. God says, be holy and live holy because I'm holy. Well, man, I, I'm never going to measure up to who God is. I mean, he's God. He's, he's the Almighty. He's the Creator. And yet, I'm supposed to measure up to that kind of creature, that kind of being? There's no way. I can't do it. Some folks take the attitude, well, if I can't do it, so why try? We should be pressing in. Daily. I need to do this. Daily, I need to sanctify myself. I, I need to just be honest and raw with God. God, I messed this up. I did it wrong. And first and foremost, I got to get it right with you. Beyond that point, it, I'm incapable of making it right with anybody else. I can attempt to. If I've offended somebody, I've done something against somebody else, I, I've got to make it right with them, yes. But if I haven't made it right with the Creator, then I'm working without any power. Somebody's unplugged me. To sanctify myself means I've got to deliberately live how God wants me to live. Sometimes that looks weird to the world. You know, the Bible says that we're a peculiar people. I like that word peculiar. That means strange. We're oddballs. We don't match the worldview of things. We don't blend in. And there's the caution. If we're blending in too much with the world, then we might not be living a life that's holy. That's not to say that we've we got to be weird all the time, but we, we've got to look at things differently. When a catastrophe happens, we don't need to have the attitude, oh my goodness, everything's falling apart. And panic. I got to tell you, I, coming through COVID made a lot of folks go crazy. We panicked. Our world has been through a lot. And this book that we read tells us that it's not over yet. And we're going to panic over, over this disorder or that disorder. At what time did we forget that God's still on the throne? We can't live a life that's holy if we're running in panic. The Bible says we're not supposed to worry about anything. That, that, that doesn't mean we won't. It just means we're not supposed to. We're supposed to have faith in God that He's working these things out. Romans 8.28 says that He works all things for our good. Even when it doesn't look good. Even, then, even when it doesn't apply into my plan. God's working that out for those who love God. 
to those who are called according to his purpose. There's that word again. That we're called. We're called to live a life that's holy. Our third one is a call to service. Nobody likes this one. This is a tough one. Scripture reminds us that all believers, not just pastors, ironically as I speak to you today, not all full-time missionaries. We tend to think call for service is vocational. It means you have to sell your house, sell everything you got, go to some third world country and, and, and do your best to, to you know, serve God. Listen, serving God is sitting in this pew. Serving God is putting an offering in a plate. Serving God is singing even if you can't carry a tune in a bucket. The Bible says make a joyful noise. It doesn't have to be a good one. It's just got to be a noise. That's serving God. Serving God is doing a job in the church. It's, it's doing something for God. Serving God is being a good neighbor. Do your neighbors know that you're a Christian or they just know you go to church on Sunday? There's a difference, you know. We used to say, never drive by our house on a Sunday afternoon. I guarantee you'll hear a fight. It sounds like a bar room. You get seven kids in one house, and then you had friends added to that. It was a zoo. It was a zoo. And it was loud, and I, I didn't like my sisters. I didn't like them. I loved them, but I didn't like them. They were irritating. Yeah, you know how girls are, right? Come on, guys, you know. Sisters are cool for a moment, but then they just get really bossy and controlling. And I was the first boy, there were three girls, and then I was born. So I, oh, damn. that's when you know God has a sense of humor, right? <laughs> they didn't like me, though, because I was the first boy. I was the first child outside of my oldest sister that didn't have hand-me-downs. You know, they had to have all new clothes because I was a boy. I was never so joyed, yeah. Call to service is being available to do whatever God wants you to do. To be available for whatever detail we need. Calling to service is sort of a no-brainer. We kind of know what that is. Someone says to church, hey, we got a job, we got to get this done, we need volunteers. That's when everybody looks down and says, oh, I hope they're not looking at me. Don't look at me. That never works. Never works. Usually, that's the first person I run to. So, Our last one we'll look at today is the call to accountability. The Bible teaches us that each of us will one day stand before the Lord. We're going to give an account. We're going to give an account of what we've done, what we haven't done. When I was a kid, they, they, you know, this was before big screens and stuff like that, so they illustrated it, that God's going to have you up on this huge movie screen your whole life before you. And man, my heart fell and my jaw dropped and I went, no. Oh man, now that should be a check in our system to say, hey, live right. Do things right. Please God, serve God. Answer the calls. This accountability, I, I sometimes think we get a little negative when we think about this. Listen, fellow Christian, you know, this is a good time. The Bible says that this is a judgment, but we sometimes think that judgment's always a negative thing. Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be some negative things we've got to clear up. But a judgment in my favor means that God's recognized the things I've done good too. Where God recognizes where I was faithful. Where I answered the call. Where I was in service. Where I was just obedient. He's going to recognize all those things. And, he, and he's going to recount them so he can say, listen, do you remember when you did this? Yeah, that wasn't so good. But here you were excellent. Here you were obedient. Do you remember when you messed this up? But this is where you were really faithful. See, I, I want to hear from God, well done, now good and faithful servant. That's the response I want to hear, but... Man, there's times where we think accountability is where we're just keeping this list. See, let me assure you that through the confession of sin, the Bible reminds us 
Now, when we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive. And to forgive means He's removed it. It no longer exists. It's no longer on the list of accountability because we've cleared it up with God. It doesn't give us a license to kind of live the way we want to live. It requires us to be accountable. Is what I'm doing pleasing to God? Is what I'm doing promoting or putting others in the way of the Lord? The truth of the matter is we sometimes are the only Jesus that someone else may see. Are we presenting the right image? To be an ambassador for Jesus Christ means that I resemble the person of Christ. Is it in my conversation? Do I lose control at Walmart? Because someone has 12 items in the 10 item line. Do I, do I lose control in traffic and all of a sudden have this sanctified righteous rage with the, my love Jesus on my bumper sticker as I cut him off? You know, I, I mean, all joking aside, we sometimes think if we're outside of this building, all of a sudden nobody knows. But God knows. God knows us. He sees us. If God's calling us to salvation, then we need to answer that one. That's not prior insurance. That's just not to keep us out of hell. That's to join us and give us audience with the Creator. Call to sanctify gives us the ability to daily cleanse ourselves and get clean and get right with Him to start the day. The call to service means once I'm clean and I'm, I'm clear and I'm ready to go, I'm now able to serve. Because honestly, to serve with an unsanctified heart, mm, that's just lip service. That's just for the eyes of men. You've done a good deed. But then the, the call to accountability puts it all into focus. Where I recognize that this is something that it's not between you and me. It's not between my wife and I. It's not between my parents and I. It's between God and me. I want my good side to be outweighing my bad side. I want the accountability to be something I think about. Because God's calling us to be accountable. And with that, let's close in prayer. Would you stand with me? God, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege to fall under the authority of your word. Your word reminds us that when we are under the authority and under that word of God, that we are now responsible for what we've heard. So, Father, you place upon us a charge to take what we've heard here today and apply it. We might be in tune with you and we might be able to be like Samuel. Hear my Lord. I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to listen. Help us, God, to, to hear you. Help us to take this charge seriously. In Jesus' name, amen.